mercy. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We are very blessed today to have our very own Mark Dergis to give the sermon for tonight. So. This is our first time back at Holy Transfiguration Church for Holy Week in such a long time. I consider this a very joyous occasion. We're back in the house of God for Holy Week. Our God is very merciful for allowing this to happen at the right time because we were closed just recently. But for us to be gathered in his house, worshiping with sincere and open hearts, this is what he's always wanted. He wants us, for us to see, to study, to, to adore, to embrace the amazing acts of our beloved Savior and the goodness of the will of the Father. He wants us to be enamored by our Savior. If he gave us this, we should offer him our best. Open and sincere hearts with a goal that this week we will be united with him. Now, I realize because of the pandemic, many of us have distanced ourselves from church. And sadly, many of us have drifted away from God himself. Here we are. We're in the final stretch of Lent. We're in the last week in Holy Week. We're hoping and praying that maybe God will work in us. Maybe he'll do something to draw us closer. Actually, that's always been his goal. He hasn't stopped trying throughout this whole pandemic to draw us close. He never gave up and he never will. There's nothing that you could do that you could get him to stop pursuing you. There's nothing you could do to get him to stop pursuing you and drawing you close. And this isn't his first time to do this. This is who he is. He did it with Israel over and over. One of the verses from a gospel passage this morning. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones, those who were sent to earth. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. He said, I tried to draw you close so many times. As a hen gathers her chicks, it was for protection. It's for comfort, for assurance. But he says words right after that where I was trying to gather you. He says these words that are very biting. He said, I tried, but you were not willing. It's actually a theme this week. It's a theme of God trying to draw his people close and his people not having a willing heart. As you will hear in the prophecies over and over, from the time in the Garden of Eden, they had incredible communion with God. It couldn't get better. They had only one command to do. And when it came time to make a decision, they were not willing to obey the command. Rather, they chose to obey their will. Would you agree that there are many times when God is asking you, maybe you're in the midst of temptation and you choose to be unwilling to choose God's way? Instead of drawing close Adam and Eve by not choosing God's will, they ended up hiding. They removed themselves and they were far away. That was the result of them not choosing God's will. In the days of Noah, we just read about Noah, the people around would not heed God's warnings from prophet to prophet to prophet. With hardness of heart, the people would not turn to God. One of the parables the Lord says in the temple, today our Lord Jesus Christ taught in the temple. It's a story, so it's not just like the past, it's, it's what he was going through this week. He tells the story of a man who had two sons. He told them to go out in the garden. One of them said, oh, yes, I will do your will. But he didn't go. 
And then the second one says, no, I won't. But then he did. Well, which one pleased the father? The one who actually did the will of the father. So the irony in all of this, this theme of people not willing to listen to God, is what we say over and over this week. Now that we're back in church, we're chanting with great enthusiasm, great zeal. Thine is the power, the glory, the blessing, the majesty. Then alternatively, when you're not saying folk that you're you're saying our father. Our father prayer over and over hundreds of times in one week. And in that prayer, you say probably one of the most important statements you could ever say in your whole life. And I want you to pay attention to that because it's one of the most important things that you could ever say in your whole life. Thy will be done. You say it over and over. The fathers highly revere this statement. This is almost like the pinnacle. This is like you have submitted everything when you say thy will be done. But sometimes we say it only with our mouths. It never drops into our hearts or comes from our hearts. Now, that could be the most important thing that you ever say. But I would argue that the most important statement that was ever made from any man occurred in the Garden of Gethsemane. When Christ was in agony, his soul was sorrowful until death, and then he uttered, These words, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. What if he stopped after the first part, after saying, let this cup pass from me? What if he just stopped? He didn't. It was a tough situation. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. I really feel like that statement should be the theme of the week. God the Father from the beginning, creating us, knowing our state, His ultimate plan for our salvation depended on that statement. Thy will be done. Hearing those words on that night must have made all the heaven rejoice. I believe those words are the sign of the greatest love. Not my will, but thy will be done. For those of you that want to try it out, you have a spouse, tell them one time, not what I want, what you want. Children, try this maybe like a thousand times. Not what I want, not my will, but your will be done. It might be one of the nicest things you could say to anyone ever. But Christ, when he said it, he just didn't say it out of the blue while he was walking in a field. There's flowers and blue skies. He actually said this statement in one of the most intense situations. He was rejected by his people. He was betrayed by his inner circle. He was alone. He was awaiting humiliation if he does the will. He was awaiting a scruciatingly painful death in the hands of those he created to save. It sounds like a terrible situation. And then he says, I submit myself to your will. I yield unto you, as the priest says in the Gregorian liturgy. I want what makes you happy. I want to put a smile on your face. And the extremeness of the situation makes that statement even that much more pleasing. To choose God over self in the most dire circumstances. I want to ask you, if you were in that situation, would you have prayed the same prayer? Father, let this pass, but not my will. That your will be done. Would that have been your prayer? Would you have said it differently? Dad, it's been good. 
but this isn't working. Uh, I, I don't feel like doing this anymore. Uh, it's really not what I want. I mean, I can't. I won't. I, I don't want to do your will anymore. Let's talk more about what I want. Which one would you have said? No, no, me and mine. Those words, no, me and mine. So many of us say this all the time in our prayers. We're stuck spiritually in the terrible twos. For those of you who have had to spend any time with toddlers, you know how much you want to get rid of those words. Stop saying no, me, and mine. I wonder how God feels when he hears those words coming from us all the time. Christ's example set for us in those words was the greatest example of conduct in the midst of an extreme temptation. We go through temptations, maybe not like that. There's mental conflict. There's overwhelming anxiety. And in that time, he was an example in action, in speech, and in purpose. To me, one of the greatest heights of spirituality is to say this with complete understanding and intention of fulfilling it. Not just with your lips, but with the intention of filling it, saying, Thy will be done. That is absolute surrender to the will of God. That actually is the goal of this week. That as he surrendered himself to the Father, that we would also follow. Now I know this prayer is one that we've prayed hundreds of times this week. Maybe thousands of times in our lives. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. How many times... Of all those thousands of times, have you really meant it from your heart? How many times have you said, I'm committed to this statement with all my being? Or are we like the people that we keep reading about in the prophecies and the gospels who paid lip service to God, but never show any sense of commitment? Thy will be done, thy will be done, tok teti gom, thy will be done. Holy Week is over. Is that the goal? Actually, in our homes, outside of Holy Week, what do we do? When we pray, we're always praying for what we want. We're usually praying for our will. Now, there are times where you say, God, but your will be done. And then you say, whatever you want. And then what happens? You get upset when you don't get what you want. When was the last time you prayed for someone with an illness that you thought was going to be healed because of the abundance and the sincerity of your prayers and they weren't? What happened? You prayed for God's will, but you never accepted it. What about other difficult situations where there's an unsatisfying job or a relationship that's not going well at all. Maybe you didn't get accepted to the school that you wanted, the career that you wanted, you didn't get the raise, you didn't receive something that you wanted, something that you wanted, and you didn't get it. And how many of you said, thank you, God, for not giving me that? You know what we say in the Thanksgiving prayer? Those things which are good and profitable do provide for us. Who makes that decision? He does. Meaning, what you see is good and profitable, I accept. And whatever you see is not good and profitable, don't give it to me. That's what we're saying, yet do we really mean it? Actually, when you're disappointed, and you prayed earnestly, you didn't get what you wanted, and you're arguing with God, God, how come? And you're in this prayer session, what do you do at the end of the prayer session? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy will be done. What we're really saying oftentimes in our prayers is, God, I'm going to tell you your will and how I want it done. And when we get upset, if he disobeys us, how backwards does that sound? 
When we're looking at wills, God's will versus our will, doesn't it make more sense to choose God's will over our own? So let's do a comparison, God versus you. His will versus yours. Why should we choose his will? This week, with your mouths, and I've heard it, very beautiful, thine is the power, thine is the glory, the blessing, and the majesty forever. When you find anyone with those traits, all-powerful, full of glory, majesty, blessing, don't you care what they think? I mean, they must have some, something good behind them to have that. I've never received any of those compliments. And not only do we say those, but to God, we also add, God is love. He sees yesterday, today, tomorrow, next week, and the next thousand years. He knows you. He knows the people you know. He knows the people you don't know. He knows what you're going to do, what they're going to do, and what the earth is going to do. He knows when there's a pandemic. He knows when there's a virus. He knows all of that. Not only does he know it, he has the power to control them. Not only does he know them and he knows what will happen, he has the power to control them. And on top of that, he really cares what happens to you. Okay, that's God's credentials. Let, let, let's look at ours. I mean, let's be fair. So let's look. Okay, we're weak. We're prone to sin. Okay, I, I really can't control situations, much less myself. Uh, I have no authority, no glory, and I bestow no blessings on anyone. So you think you know yourself as much as God does? No way. Whose will should you choose based on those? Okay, forget that. Forget, forget character. Okay, let's look at experience. How many lives have you run, been in charge of before this one? Give or, okay, zero. Okay, all right, fine. But God, billions of people, trillions of creatures, jillions of stars and planets. This is something that boggles my mind. He tells the sun where to hide until morning. He tells the stars where to shine, when to shine, and how bright to shine. You know that the birds don't typically die of hunger? The Bible tells us, and God somehow works the lives of all those insects and worms to satisfy the hunger of birds. Thank God you are not an insect or a worm. Living for the satisfaction of a bird. Do you know how many birds there are on the planet at any one time? Me neither, but God does. What is your track record? Have you ever made a mistake in choosing? You want to know what God's track record is? His track record is, is perfect. Zero mistakes. And in the end, your will centers around you most of the time. It's selfish. So do you think everyone should follow their own will? Or just you, like maybe you're the only person that should follow your own will. What if the whole world followed their own will? We would all be Hitler. It would be chaos. So from a logical point of view, it makes sense to choose God's will. But what are our issues with choosing God's will? His will may not appeal to me. It may not seem comfortable. It may not be pleasing to me. Well, for Christ that night, it was not comfortable. It's not always easy to forgive first. But it's so funny how after we say that it will be done, you want to know what we say about two sentences later? Forgive us as we forgive others. And yet oftentimes... It's like saying, God, don't forgive me because I'm not forgiving others. It's hard to apologize first. Sometimes it's hard to love when you're not being loved back. It's hard to give more and more when you're trying to save for you. You're trying to show mercy. You're supposed to show mercy when you're angry. It's hard to sometimes not judge, but it makes you feel so good. I mean, about yourself. But well, what if there's something that God 
because his will is good, he's trying to get you to let go of. You know it's his will. You know what I'm talking about. In your life, it's gnawing at your conscience. It's the habit that maybe you've tried to hide from everyone around you. It's the one that causes you the most guilt in your life. It's the one that tears you away from Christ. It might even be destroying your family. There might be some idol in your life, whether it be your job or your career or the next Bitcoin bull run, the next jackpot that's going to make you rich. You're looking for the approval of the people around you. You want everyone to compliment you and say, oh, you're so wonderful. You're so beautiful. This is great. And you do this. You're awesome. Sometimes you want to be the best among all the people around us. And we want the admiration of everyone. But we're not trying to be their servant. But you know the will of God is to be the servant. But we're trying to, to get everyone's admiration. To be not the servant. Not to be the least. But to be the, the greatest. It's kind of exactly what he said not to do. The non-stop shopping. The non-stop acquiring more things. Not for the poor of the world. But we're, usually it's for us. The love of comfort, the love of pleasure, the fine things, the endless search on our phone for the next thing that's going to make us laugh or gossip or help our political projections. And what if God says, just stop, just let it go. That's You know it's his will, but you, you won't. When it comes down to it, we oftentimes know what God's will is in certain situations. You want to know what? We just don't want it. Why? Because we maybe we have to call it what it is. Maybe we just don't care about God that much. Why does our soul rebel against God's will and allowances? Why do we rebel? Because we have not revered God as God. The omnipotent, the all-knowing, the all-present, the all-powerful God. We just don't regard him as that. And maybe we just don't trust God that much. We trust oftentimes in our abilities, our connections, our skills, our experiences, our money, whatever we have, more than God. And the reason, here's something that's an example of this. We feel like we need to know the details of God's will. We don't like not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow. How annoying is this to have a passenger that you're driving somewhere and they don't know the directions and they keep asking you questions about every single turn. It drives you crazy. If you've had to drive your parents somewhere, you may have experiences. They don't know the way. They don't need to know the way because you know it. They just need to let you go because you know the way. You're like, it's so annoying. Stop. I'm the one who knows. Stop asking. In the situation of you and God, which one are you? Let me ask you one more question. What will happen to me if I obey God's will? What's going to happen? What if he asks me to do something crazy, like build an ark on dry land that I'm preparing for a flood that I've never seen before, and it might take me decades before it ever happens? And I'm supposed to have the animals as my passengers on this ark? Okay, Let's say he says, just get up, move away from your family and your land. Just go to a place where I'm going to show you. Kind of like Abraham. Okay, forget that. What if he says, I'm going to give you a crazy service. There's a few million Jewish people that are slaves of the Egyptian Pharaoh. I want you to go and grab them and take them out. And I want you to take them into the desert where there's lots of heat. But there's no shade, there's no water, there's no shelter, there's no weapons, there's no army for you. And I want you to, you're like, what? I could keep going on and on, but hopefully you realize the stories that I just mentioned are the names of the people that we call heroes of faith. A group of people who had the audacity to put God's will above their own. What was their result? Was it destruction? Did any of them end up in a worse state than they started when they chose God's will? Could they have chosen anything better for themselves than God's will? What benefit they had by saying this, not my will, 
but thy will be done. Do you want me to read the stories of the miserable ones who said this? Not your will, but my will be done? You want to read those stories? We don't have enough time, and it would be frightening. Oftentimes, it would be like looking at a mirror of our souls. So how do we get to this level of saying thy will and not my will? How do we get there? How to begin to not just choose, but to follow? The first one is complete distrust of yourself. The beginning of salvation consists in rejecting your own will and understanding and doing the will of God. It's like a kid when you're walking and they're holding your hand and you tell them, don't let go. But then they let go and they fall and get hurt. It doesn't take long before they realize, I can't do this on my own. I'm not in control. I know I want to, but I can't. I know I think I can, but I can't. I'm afraid to let someone else take control of my life. Either way, you can't. The fathers say, don't trust yourself this side of the grave. This week, one of the things that we could learn or should learn, crucifixion, we talk, Arch Mark Solomon spoke about it yesterday a lot, about the idea of dying with Christ, that we might be resurrected, or it's no longer, I've been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. How is it that I no longer live? Because I've been crucified to the world. The crucifying of self and my will is actually one of the PowerPoints of this week. The second thing is you have to have a complete trust in God's providence. Pope Perlo says this, I trust that God sees you. He hears you. He feels for you. So your little matters are very big before his love. And your big matters are very small. Meaning every little thing he cares about and every big thing that you're worried about is nothing for him. He's actually called faithful for a reason. He has plans for you and they're good ones. His plans for you, his will is for your salvation and your sanctification. He wants to strengthen you. Sometimes we need to let God be God. And that's what a God is. The one you worship. The one you consider to be great and mighty and powerful and control and able. To not trust that God is to have a lack of faith. And to lack faith in Hebrews 11 tells us what? To lack faith, to not have faith, it means what? It is impossible to please God. If I were to sum up those two points, complete distrust of myself, complete confidence in God, I think it comes down to that verse. He must increase, but I must decrease. He is greater than me. And that is something that I always forget. The one you're dealing with is not just a little bit better than you. He's a lot. Better than us. I'm almost there. On the night when Christ said this, thy will be done, he went to his disciples, and you know what? Their spirit was willing. But you know what the problem was? Why they didn't carry it out? Because the flesh is weak. He wanted them to pray. They were willing, but they didn't carry it out because they weren't willing to fight the flesh. Are we willing to fight the flesh until it hurts? What does St. Paul says? I need you to resist sin to the point of what? To the point of bloodshed. Sometimes we have to fight when it comes to praying. You know God's will. He, he wants you to pray. Or he wants you to fast. He wants you to wake up for church. He wants you to abstain from certain lustful thoughts. To refrain from just throwing money away. Carelessly all about yourself. Worrying about this. What you're going to wear. What you're going to eat on Saturday night. Where you're going to drive. Are you afraid to get your hands dirty in the work of the Lord? And you're like, ah, I can't. Because your flesh is preventing you, even though you're like, I want to, but I just, I just can't. Well, fighting the flesh is also carrying the cross. Um, 
before I get to that, one of the things I need to tell you this. You have to make your decision to follow God's will beforehand. It needs to be something that you decide before you're in that dire situation where your body is raging, your mind is all over. You might be surrounded uh, with people that are naysayers. You might be in a moment of weakness, an emotional low or a high. It's the worst time to make that decision. You want to know the best time to make that decision? When did Christ make it? We heard on in John 12 after Palm Sunday, he, he's distressed. He says, Lord, should I ask you to take me from this hour? He says, no. He says, for this purpose, I've come for this hour. That was not on Good Friday. That was not on Thursday. That was days before. Actually, he made the decision before he left heaven. When he came down, he says, I am going to follow my Father's will no matter what. You know that sign that people oftentimes put in their homes? homes me and my house. As for me and my house, we will do what? We will serve the Lord. So when there's a time to make a decision, I've already made it. When there's a decision, do we serve? No, we're going to serve. Do I follow God's will? You need to decide. St. Paul talks about this when he's talking to the Corinthians about, he says, you talk about giving donations. He says, I don't have it here. He says, at first, there has to be a willing mind. Do you have a mind that's willing to follow God? Then the Bible tells us, and some of this we do, we pray. You can pray for God's will. David in the psalm, we read this in the Igbeya every morning. David says, teach me to do your will for you are my God. Colossians 1.9. I hope this sounds familiar to you because I tell you guys, this is one of the best prayers for you to pray in your daily lives. 1, 9 to 12. It's the best prayer. It says, for this reason, St. Paul is saying, this is one of the things I'm praying for you. Since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. The next few verses are awesome. Then this, last verse. Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, which is quite a feat, okay, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, which is why we're here, may he make you complete in every good work to do what? To do his will. May he make you complete to do his will. Working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, which is his will, through Jesus Christ, who followed the Father's will, to whom be glory forever. Amen. The last reason why you should make the decision to say, not my will, but thy will be done, is just for God's pleasure. Just to make God the Father happy. You know, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy, it wasn't for the pleasure of the cross, but for the joy of what? Pleasing his Father and saving you. I want you to have this mentality when you wake up. Dear God, not my will. Help me to do not my will, but your will. How long? How long should you say that? And I actually think you should say it starting tomorrow. Actually, starting tonight. Not my will, but thy will be done. I want you to say it every day in the morning when you wake up throughout the day. Until when? I want you to be able to say that until you can say this last phrase. With our Lord Jesus Christ until your last breath when you can finally say, it is finished. Say, God, I want to do your will until your last breath. You can say with Jesus Christ, I've done it. It's finished. May God be glorified in our carrying out his will, not our own. Have a blessed Holy Week.